Hello, everybody. All right. Welcome to Letterform Lectures, online edition. While we're waiting for everybody to join us, please uh, drop where you're coming from in the chat and also uh, let us know what brought you here today. So, since we do have an international audience, we want to find out where everyone is coming from. So please type where you're coming from in the chat. And um, if you don't mind letting us know how you found out about this or what led you here for this uh, lecture today, please put that in the chat as well. OK, people are rolling in. Um, it is just past noon, so I'm going to get started here. Welcome to Letterform Lectures Online Edition. My name is Grendel, and I am Education Director at Letterform Archive. And as mentioned, we have an international audience today, so please type in where you're coming from in the chat and what brought you here today. If you have questions for our speaker, please put those in the Q&A and uh, upvote the ones that you'd like to see answered. We'll deal with that at the end. First, I wanna give a huge shout out to Skilla Zaccolini. Skilla is the brains and the brawn behind this lecture series. Thank you, Skilla. All right, Letterform Archive is the home of Type West, which is our school of type design. And we have a slew of great lectures and public workshops for you coming up this year. And I will tell you about a few of them in just a second. But before we get rolling, I am thrilled to announce that the Type West Postgraduate Certificate Program in Type Design Class of 2022 has graduated. Um, here's a link to their website showcasing all their glorious new typefaces. And Skilla will drop that link for you in the chat as well. So please check those out. You will be blown away. Okay, here's some upcoming events. We have a special Letterform lecture this Thursday. Um, we are hosting Stephen Heller, uh, and he will be interviewed on his early years as a graphic designer in counterculture New York by the CCA MFA design program chair. John Sueda, who also happens to be associate curator of exhibitions at Letterform Archive. This should be a wild ride. Don't miss it. And um, since 2018, Muk Monsalve has been hosting and curating type walks around Buenos Aires, Argentina. And this project, uh, which she calls Letra Capital, um, showcases and shares the love that uh, she feels when walking around their city. And so please join MOOC on um, Thursday, uh, Tuesday, March 28th, as she shares this love for, with you. I'm looking forward to getting a tour of Buenos Aires myself. OK, then we also have a salon coming up, which is going to be a hybrid event. So it's in person and online. It's called Recovering the Forgotten Women of Metal Type Design. Um, and Bethany Qualls, who is a, a scholar and has been researching with us, highlights how women's contributions in the metal type era have mostly been erased or ignored. And she tries to fill in those gaps for us. So. Finally, there's one more month to see our in-person exhibition, Strike Through, which ends on April 16th. And we will have two more salons coming up with artists featured in the show. Those are happening on April 6th and April 13th. So please stay tuned to our newsletter for more details or go to ledarc.org slash events. Better yet, become a member. To help keep great lectures like today's going, go to ledarc.org slash join and become a member today. And finally, be sure to follow us on Instagram to stay on top of upcoming events and programs. Okay, welcome to Letterform Lectures 2023. 
Letterform lectures are co-presented by the Letterform Archive and the SFPL Book Arts and Special Collections. Letterform Archive is a nonprofit institution housing over 100,000 works of graphic design history. Come on over and visit us sometime. We are open. We'd like to thank Adobe for generously sponsoring the video recording of this lecture series. You can view all Letterform lectures online soon after they happen. Just check our website, letterformarchive.org. OK, finally, we come to our main event. Uh, Jumana Medlej is an artist, an author, and an educator from Lebanon. And she's best known for her work with early Arabic calligraphy, the Kufi script. She researches these scripts from primary sources, uncovering their original practice while deriving her own visual language from them. She also specializes in the art materials of that period, and she prepares her own supplies using medieval techniques and forages for pigments and dyes herself. Now, because her work is very serious, most people assume that what she listens to as she works runs along the same lines. However, she claims to be an enormous geek. And the soundtrack to her work is not Gregorian chant, but Doctor Who audio dramas. Interesting. <laughs> OK, <laughs> without further ado, let's welcome Juana Midledge. Take it away, Juana. <laughs> oh dear, my secret is out. Um, <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, it's lovely to to have so many people, and I I just saw so many familiar names going through the chat very quickly. So it's really nice to uh, to have everybody here. Um, I am just going to jump right in into my presentation, basically, because I I think that's it for my personal introduction. Um, so just briefly, I'm going to talk about my background a bit what is Kufi, and then show how I work with it. And then, let's see. All right. OK. Oh. Oh, sorry. OK. OK. Um, so a little bit about my background, how I got where I am, basically. Um, this journey started in 2007 in this space, which is the studio of um, a lovely calligraphy master called Samir Sayer, which uh, many of you might have heard of. And uh, in 2007, he asked me to come and be his assistant and help him um, in his work. And I did that um, for several years. I was there almost daily. And Sayer is not a traditional calligrapher, but he reinvents the script constantly, whether in constructed form or in cursive. And he doesn't like traditional forms at all. He just likes to do his thing. Now, I definitely, I call him my teacher, absolutely. Uh, he's very special to me, but no teaching took place in that space, in the, no teaching the way we understand it. We just worked. We didn't talk about what we were doing. We just did it. And after five years of this, through the variety of projects and styles, I internalized the core principles that run through the script. Uh, and that's what I call the essence of Kufi. Um, in other words, it was a kind of traditional apprenticeship uh, of a type older than the formal schools of calligraphy that exist today. So this core, this core understanding was in place before I started uh, an in-depth research on the history and the many faces of Kufi, which include also the ecosystem it belongs to, because you can't rip it off of that ecosystem. Um, you know, the materials used, how it's practiced, what, it what its purpose was, and so on. And this allowed me to tie together embodied practice with historical data. Um, so <clears throat> for the past, 10 years in particular, which is since I moved to London, working with Kufi has been my full-time practice. Um, and I'm not the only person working with the script, although very few actually do. As far as I can tell, I'm the only one who's working with it, with it from within that tradition, instead of looking at it through a distorting filter of later scripts. Uh, and I think that's a very important point, personally. 
So what exactly is Kufi? I need to give a brief primer here so that we're on the same page because it's not what most people think it is. There's a huge amount of misinformation floating around and nowhere more so than in the world of Arabic calligraphy. So to begin with, Kufi was not born in Kufa, um, whatever th this very stubborn myth might say. So its very name is meaningless, but we're kind of stuck with it. Um, and it's going to be very hard to agree on the better name for it, but it's basically the original tradition of Arabic calligraphy. And I mean the entire tradition. It's not one specific style. It's an entire way of working with the Arabic script. Uh, that is very different from modern Arabic calligraphy. And you know, anything later than the 12th century is modern to me. It's, it's very new. Um, so very briefly, the prototype, the first moment where the very loosely defined uh, so-called Hijazi, which is basically handwriting more than calligraphy, the, the moment where this acquires proportions and geometric consistency and kind of internal rules, and it becomes the first calligraphic script of Arabic is the mosaic inscription inside the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which you can see here. Um, in reality, it's not, you know, it's just one line running around the inside of the dome here. There, it's not uh, superimposed like that, but it's hard to find photos of it. Um, so here we have a calligrapher who worked with a mosaic artist, and this resulted in a particular sense of form that defined the direction this script would grow in. And from this point, we this gave rise to the two great branches of Kufi. Uh, on the left, you have the Handasi style, and in Arabic, Handasi means both architectural and geometric. They're the same word. And on the right, you have Mushafi, which is manuscript, manuscript Kufi, of which there are also many variants. So let's refer to them as constructed versus written, because this is how you produce them. And the constructed styles are typically designed or created by removing material from a hard surface, as you see here, whereas the written ones, you actually add material in the, you know, in the shape of, of ink usually on a writing surface. Um, but despite these two very different methods, there's a big similarity, and it's my belief that the written styles always emulated the constructed Kufi, because when you practice manuscript Kufi, you soon realize it is always aspiring to be architectural um, and not to be calligraphic. Um, if, you, if you see all these right angles and uh, you know, round curves, um, they don't happen naturally when you're writing with the pen. You have to put them in deliberately. And I, I believe that is uh, because it aspired to, to remain architectural in forms rather than to become a fluid calligraphic style. Um, another point about Kufi is that it's not linear for the most part. It's made up of full forms, so it's not useful to think about it in terms of a line, of a continuous line, as you normally do in calligraphy. Instead, it's made up of shapes like building blocks. And most constructed styles have the negative spaces carved out of it. So they are very small negative spaces. They're practically not there. And at its most accomplished, the written variants, they emulate the same compact shaping. If you can see on the right, it, it it's very visible in this uh, example written in gold, where these are really compact shapes. One special uh, special case, special variant of Kufi is, is known as square Kufi, among other names. And this took shape in Central Asia between the 11th and the 13th century. And this is very much a Kufi style. It is firmly based on the same script grammar as Kufi but it's massively misrepresented in the Western Islamic world, by which I mean the Levant and uh, Egypt and Turkey. Um, and my, you know, my understanding is that in those times, the, the, some designs made their way to those regions on paper, but the masters that designed them did not make the journey. So they, there was a lack of knowledge there. Anyway, I've, I, I keep boring my students about this constantly, so I won't go on too much about it. Uh, but the, the result is that in, in that part of the world, they're constantly trying to push round script habits on it. But square, square Kufi in itself, it represents Kufi in its most stripped down state, where only the essence is kept to the point that legibility is not even a consideration anymore. So the general takeaway from this 
um, as, as you can see, I keep I keep posting styles. I have dozens, if not hundreds, of different styles of kufi. Um, so on. So the takeaway is that unlike the highly standardized round scripts, kufi cannot be neatly divided into a small number of well-defined styles. There are broad groups. Uh, and there are regional tendencies that we can recognize, but within each there is endless variation. Just like in my teacher studio, the script is constantly reinvented. Um, and this is because there is no one right way of, of working with it. The script, this script is not defined by its outer form, which remains fluid, but by a series of relationships between letters and variables that, that cannot be put down as simple black and white instructions. So every calligrapher can and did style the basic structure in their own subtle way, or sometimes less subtle. So we see endless creativity in Kufi inscriptions. But this came from a place of deeply understanding the rules that hold it together. Um, and in later centuries, when it stopped being practiced for writing the Quran, we see this understanding fading away as it stops really being taught in that way. And Kufi inscriptions become more and more stilted and lifeless as the reliance moves entirely to the outer form, and then we see over elaborate letters that end up just tacked together, which I'm not showing here because the why, why? <laughs> so I was talking about internalizing the inner principles of the script, and this leads us to my own work. This is my studio. Well, a, a little bit of it, at least. Um, I'm basically not showing you the mess. Uh, in my art practice, what I do is I give form to the formless. In a nutshell, I work with archetypes and ideas that would not be served by a figurative approach. Um, but they also would not be served by complete abstraction. That would not really express what I need. So using Kufi allows me to create forms that are made up of pure meaning. And this could be said of any script, but here the operative word is form. I'm not writing text. I do not want people to read the work. I'm creating visual symbols. Um, and Kufi is really visually powerful for that. In a way, I'm returning to the original role of architectural calligraphy because that was not expected to be read. So it needed instead to visually convey the impact of the text so that even if somebody could not read it, they would still feel it. Um, and Kufi has this unique relationship with form and very few people today can actually read it. So the visual aspect is not uh, immediately overruled by a reading reflex. You know, if you, if you look at the billboard, you immediately read it. You have to make an effort to actually look at the shape of the letters. So with Kufi, this doesn't happen. People, people still see the shape first. Um, so I will start by showing you some examples derived from the constructed types of Kufi. And I share some of my sketches as well, so that you don't just see my final decision, but a bit of various things I tried. Um, when I work with constructed kufi, I, which by now you know it's not a style, it's an approach. It's a way of working with it. I always start from a single word, that is the idea I want to express. And then I look for a pattern uh, contained within the word itself. You know, what has this uh, what potential does this word have to become a, a form? And I know I'm going to be repeating it and maybe rotating it. So I look for the most powerful configuration of the letters. When you stop seeing letters and you just see one compelling symbol. So this one, for instance, is the word kun, which is B, which is, of course, the word that brought creation into being. So this is why I'm starting with it, really. It's an old piece, but I'm quite fond of it still. Um, so there's no set method for when I work like this. And I, I just pro tip, do not, please, please do not ask me what my work process is. I hate this question. It, it bores me to tears. There's no work process. Every, every piece is different. Um, so I play around. I just play around. And I try different types of shapes. And it's, it's very dependent on that word. I try different things until something falls into place, until I can see how... Um, my teacher used to say, Bikmush, you know, it catches. Something just catches and it feels right. Now, if nothing feels right and the sketching starts to feel contrived, like I'm trying too hard, I just leave it and I return to it days later, months later, even sometimes years later. I have some work that really, between the first moment of wanting to do it until it's finally done, it was years in between. 
This one is the word surrender, but uh, the treatment is such that you can easily think the shapes are negative space and that the lines themselves are the design. So that is a way, another way of um, um, preventing reading and instead making you experiencing it as a form. Um, now, um, pointing, as in the dots on the letters and other diacritics like Shadda, Hamza, and so on, they're completely optional in Kufi. And, and in fact, most of them did not even exist in that style. So there's complete freedom whether I use them or not. Now, when it suits me, I use them so that I can introduce highlights, um, a contrasting form like circle versus the square forms of the letters, or you know, gold, because I do like having golden highlights or different color. So they don't fall under the resim. The resim is the very basic shape of a letter, what is absolutely essential and that absolutely needs to be there. But in Kufi, the resim is much simpler than, than it is now. So because they're not part of the resim, there's a great deal of freedom in their use. But of course, um, freedom means you can really go over the top very easily. So here, finding just the right balance is, um, is the, the tricky part. Now, this word is story, and much of its visual interest comes from, from the dots and the shadda, how they are placed to complete the central design. In this one, which is the word himma, the whole motion of the piece is down to the dots. But in fact, this particular letter, which is ta marbuta, did not, did not exist in Kufi. And if I was doing a period accurate piece, I would never use it. And I actually tell my students, do not, you know, just stay away from this letter. But here I'm, I'm doing contemporary creative work. So the three letters in this word, Himma, they happen to all be round letters. So this allowed me to reduce them to one shape that echoes itself throughout the layers. And then it's the dots that give the whole movement that show you how the word is rotating. And this is actually a wall sculpture. You can see it's not painted. Uh, it, is, it is quite large and it's in several layers uh, cut in wood. Now, early on, back in time, I still thought much more in terms of shaped letters and the forms that could create. Now, this is a very early piece, and I put a lot of number symbolism in the proportions of the shapes, and the shapes themselves were symbolic, you know, circle, crescent, almond. It's the word here, so it was all about feminine symbolism. Now, 12 years later, I find this pre really contrived and very arbitrary, and I don't like arbitrary. <laughs> Um, this, and I find this whole approach to symbolism very shallow now. I, I don't do this anymore. And I remember how much I struggled to, to get the design right for this piece because it was so arbitrary. There were too many options. There were no guidelines. There was nothing real to anchor it on. So I'm showing it as an example of something really that is really quite um, um, a passé, I would say in my work. Now, this other one, um, it's also quite shaped in the sense that it's shaped around the spaces of the letters, but it's relying more on the expression, the ex an expressionist impact than symbolism, because symbolism anyway, if you don't know it, then you miss it. So what's the point? Um, so this is where companionship, so just the way the, the words are in pairs kind of, and then in a circle kind of expresses the idea. Uh, but there's a detail here, that there's something I took a step too far that I would never allow myself to do now. And I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to share my shame, but I'm sure I have a few students in the audience who spotted it immediately. So feel free to email me and tell me, ha. Now this one, Noor, which is light, it's a, it, this is a more mature piece, even though it's still quite reliant on shape. Um, the arrangement of the letters is very simple. It's very basic. I did not spend hours trying to be clever at all. But the harmony comes from simply curving angles in the right places and making the most of the tails and of the optional dots. Basically, I wanted a radiant mandala to express the word. And the way the tails interlace is kind of evocative of a web of light. And it's finished with light catching iridescent pigment, which sadly you cannot, you cannot appreciate on the screen. But it means that even in a dark room, it will still shine. 
um, and, and float. And the background is a, is a dark backdrop of subtle geometry that you can just see, I think. So which is, was meant to evoke the, the invisible order behind all things. Now, over time, my approach is becoming more and more essential. Um, and I, th I think more and more in terms of very pure shapes from which lines are carved out or small spaces are removed to create a letter. So the space is only there if it needs to be there. I don't design around it anymore. And on the contrary, it's, it's the thing that I could take out. Now for this design, which is mu'min, the word mu'min, I completely broke down the word when I realized that all the letters could be reduced to a circle. So meme is a circle anyway. Wow only needs this small curve taken out and it makes it look like it's smiling, which I really like. And noon just needs a line carved out and the rest it down to, to the dots. Well, there's a dot and there's a Hamza, um, which gave me the opportunity to create this, to my mind, totally irresistible ultramarine and gold contrast. And the first word, sorry, the first meme of the word mu'min is shared between the six repetitions. So this is where this, um, this very simple design comes from. And this is also done in wood, so it has a lot of presence. Um, one of my better designs, I think. And of course, I cannot repeat it because every word requires a certain treatment, but that's not gonna work on any other word. So that's interesting. Now, so the words become more and more abstracted and I only add shaping or even negative space if they contribute something to the design. Here I used a device that is very common in ornamental kufi, which is a little dip of the baseline between two letters. Um, yeah, my, sorry, I, my cursor doesn't work when I'm a presentation, so I can't point it out, but I used it to mirror the tail of the scene and stretching both of these towards the center while keeping them angular got this really unusual sh shape. And then I totally exaggerated the dot over the noon. Well, it's supposed to be over the noon, but I centered it, again, abstraction, to create this regular golden disk that finishes the composition. And, you know, I, I don't care that it's illeg illegible because the letters are still perfectly... Uh, respectable. There's nothing, I did not distort them very much. I stretched a little, but I stretched permissible uh, bits, but it turned it into something that looks almost Aztec. Um, this is the word khayal, imagination, and here the simplification brings out squarely, no pun intended, into uh, square Kufi territory. Um, <clears throat> So I, and I love just removing the spaces to fill the surface completely. Then it just looks like abstract white lines um, over a blue background, basically, if you, if you don't realize what you're looking at. And the pattern of golden diamonds, these are the dots, and this is the pattern they create as the word is rotated. So you have two layers of happening here. And this, this piece is quite 3D because it's, um, it's done on wood, but the, the, the design goes around the sides as well. Um, in one series I did based on medieval cosmology, the work got much more complex because I was encoding entire diagrams into Kufi-based patterns. So this one, for instance, which almost killed me, um, is a map of the cosmos. From the four elements in the center, the four elements that make up our sphere, through the, the seven planets, uh, to the outer divine spheres on the outside. And the, the concept is quite simple. I'm just writing the names in, in concentric circles, but planning this was very tricky. And then painting it, this is 120, meters, uh, 120 centimeters square uh, was basically the difficult part. Then you have the gardens of paradise as described in detail uh, by Ibn Arabi. That's where I, I based my diagram on. There are seven levels of gardens uh, they are inserted between the sphere of the moon, which is what you see in the center, and the fixed stars outside, the fixed stars being the, the zodiac, basically, and just before the, the, the planes of the divine realm. And this is a very rare case of me using foliated kufi 
which most of the time I cannot stand. Uh, because it was so appropriate to create the feel of gardens. Um, this one's a on completely other topic, but again, same kind of complexity. Um, and it's, it's, it deconstructs the word Anna, which is the big blue word. Anna means I. And if you come closer to it, this word dissolves into hundreds of puzzle pieces, to be exact, 432 pieces that turn out to be third person pronouns in Arabic, he, she, it, they, and so on. There are quite a lot of those in Arabic. So it's about um, questioning what our identity is really made of. And is there really something behind all these other influences if you, if you strip them all out? So that is the question that this poses. But at the same time, I constantly remind myself not to be afraid of simplicity. Simplicity is very powerful because you cannot hide your mistakes and you cannot hide design weaknesses. So if you get it right, you, it has maximum impact. And if you get it wrong, it's immediately visible. So, you know, you have to be very honest. <clears throat> and this piece was very simply born. It was a bit, it was just fancy. It was born of my um, being intrigued by the letter Kaf because it comes up in significant places. It's an isolated letter in the Quran. It's the name of a mythical mountain um, that features in the Conference of the Birds and other, other stories like that. Um, and it's meant to be, you're meant to cross seven valleys to reach Mount Kaf, but also Mount Kaf surrounds the world. So this is the image that came out of this paradox. And it's cut in a single piece of paper, which is a lot harder <laughs> than it sounds. And it's, again, one and a half meter piece of paper. Um, and there are levels that you can't really see here, but it was it was assembled in quite a complex way. And it's very simple, but strangely, it's a very popular uh, piece of mine. Now, in this word, which is hidad, uh, which means mourning, the, the extreme simplicity of the design was, was allowed by the word itself because it happened to be formed of letters that can be really, really stripped down. So... And actually, I literally use strips of paper woven together to form the letters, and then just a few pencil lines to finish them, and that's it. But this, again, is not po really possible with any other word, and it wouldn't make sense with any other word in the same way. Okay, so there, here we have a diptych. This was the first piece in, in a diptych where the script breaks down completely. In fact, uh, what you see is the trace it leaves behind. <clears throat> The subject of the diptych is flight and refuge, and um, basically inspired by by the uh, the the experience of refugees. I mean, the whole the whole thing, and this has become very uh, current again in the UK at the moment. So um, here, there is a, a a gentle pencil grid that is sadly not visible. It's too gentle to be visible in the digital image. But chunks of paper are cut out of it, and they're actually the letters of the that form the word firar, and they're dispersed as if by an explosion, and they leave behind this gutted grid or gutted society. And the more pieces are removed, the more fragile the grid that is left behind. Whereas this, the second one in the diptych, which is refuge, is is the antithesis, where now you have. Um, a whole a wholeness, a wholesomeness, um, and a safe looking um, composition using the same colors, but now they're they're you know there's a place waiting these pieces that are looking for a safe refuge uh, refuge. Um, and it's still Kufi. It's a slightly different style of Kufi, but um, it's interesting how just from the same same script you can express such different things just from the way you compose it. Now, I'm sure you noticed along this series that the mediums I use are very varied. Uh, from a simple, simple paint to cut paper, um, wood assemblage. Um, I've also used uh, copper, laser cut copper, which I haven't included in the presentation. So I'm not bound by a specific technique, which is one of my downfalls as an artist, because I cannot say I'm, a, I'm an oil artist or I'm a dis artist. <laughs> so I, I can do anything. Um, but I am very materials oriented. And for me, working with my hands is the whole point. So 
this digital series that I created is, is a, really a one-off. I'm very fond of it though. It's called A Year with the Earth. And I wanted to share it because um, of how it contrasts the, the, the streamlined geometry of Kufi with the organic exuberance of photographic nature elements. So I spent an entire year every month going on a walk, taking photos of everything I came across month by month, and then assembling them in the composition to show this contrast. Um, and, uh, and I really love it, but I was not consciously making a reference to traditional Islamic art, which actually, if you look through it, this is a very, very old practice. You know, the impulse to bring together the, the geometry of Kufi with nature elements goes all the way back. And this is just one example because we could have spent all the evening looking at examples. But um, this is a photo I took in the Alhamra in Granada uh, last summer. And that shows basically exactly the same, the same idea. Um, now, finally, in terms of unusual mediums and uh, how much is made possible by the simple geometry of the script, this is a, a pattern I designed in Square Kufi to knit it for this piece. And the word is fatak, fatak, which means unraveling. And the piece is called unraveling. Um, you know, I, I think it's obvious. It's about our world, you know, the way our world is unraveling into a polarized mess. Um, but you can just see a new pattern being revealed by this unmaking. This is this was the first piece in a in a series I'm working on right now, where you have this this tension between what is what is going and what is remaining, or what is coming into being. <clears throat> Now, all this was <clears throat> the constructed um, branch of, of Kufi. Now, the calligraphic branch, um, for me, it offers a bit less scope, except in the exploration of pattern. I mean, I teach uh, written calligraphy a lot, um, his, in a historical written calligraphy, so because I'm very big on authenticity, but the, I, I practice it less. Um, because you can't play with the letters quite as much, or at least I don't like to. However, as a practice, it, it's the one that offers the most insight into the historic, historical process. And it's a much more immersive practice than the planning that goes into constructed designs. You know, for all these designs where I use cut paper, etc. once I have the design, it's all a question of one step at a time, preparing this, painting that, gluing them together and so on so but in this one in when you work with something like this especially when you're working with patterns which is what interests me in this um every you know every repetition is written by hand there's no room for error there is no room for a slip of the pen there's no undo button and you cannot bring a bring paper back to whiteness if you mess up so you have to be completely present and you have to just do it and you have to be prepared to start over uh, if you if you mess up, happily, that that has not happened to me so far. Um, so, in the the written strand, I focused on a characteristic quality of calligraphic kufi, which is that every letter is shaped as if for the first time. So every one is different, even though they are the same letter. And in this piece, which was my first attempt in that, I give each of these hundreds of letters, eight hundred, to be exact, eight hundred letters my full attention and intention. So this was not a mechanical process of just repeating a letter. It was everyone, I treated it like an individual. So sometimes they're a bit longer, sometimes the space is a bit bigger, sometimes, you know, I was trying all these really tiny variations, trying to circle around what makes this letter what it is. Um, and so the the... The, the presence of the hand is visible, and that is what brings this pattern to life. Because if I had done this on the computer, it would be absolutely boring and pointless. But here, it's not just the individuality of the letters, but you can actually see how the pen is getting worn down as I go. And then there's one moment where I, I have to stop and cut it again, and then it changes, the texture changes again. 
And I find that really wonderful. And it reminds me of um, coarse, you know, handwoven cloth. So I got really into this for a while. Um, and even though I cannot reshape the letters as much as I do with the constructed kufi, manuscript kufi is itself designed to create compact groups so that it reads like shapes rather than a su succession of letters. I, I said that in the beginning. And this means I can manipulate the negative space in creating patterns. But some words lend themselves to this much more than others. And interestingly, the word Allah, which I used here, is incredibly plastic, more than any other word I can think of. And here I was just basically creating um, half squares with it. So it's a, it's a triangle that is half a square. And a simple change in colors created this movement. Uh, and, and to be honest, the, the, the change in colors is, was completely based on knitting patterns because I was also getting into knitting at that point. So a match made in heaven, and this is called heaven and earth. Um, this one is also an interesting word. It's simply the word hub, um, which happens to be, you can simplify it to this point. Uh, and I'm, I haven't contrived anything, but I've just slightly exaggerated the, the simplification. And then you cannot even know that there's a word there. All you see is this lovely kind of very textile effect. Um, and somebody who, who was seeing it in a gallery so pointed out that it, the negative space, there's all these little crosses like kisses running through the, the piece, which I thought was really lovely. Now this one I'm showing, so these are both mine. The one on the left was a historical recreation I did in Eastern Kufi uh, style. And really, I kind of reproduced the look of a particular Quran, uh, but using a, a quote from Jibran Khalil Jibran. And I used historical materials and everything. I had a lot of fun doing that. But on the right is a, using the same, the same script, the same style to, to again, to create the pattern. So really pushing its, uh, its expressive potential by just repeating a very simple word. And the word is bir. And actually the choice of the word, even though the shape the shape was perfect for this, um, bir means, well, you can read it bir, you can read it bar, it's the same word, but bar means, uh, you know, the, the, the land, the earth, the wilderness. Whereas bir means great love, devotion, and reverence. And this piece is made entirely, it's a single origin piece because all the pigments I gathered myself in, in the mountains in Lebanon on the same day. Um, so this is why the word is so appropriate with that. And you can see the, the signature, the visual signature of this Eastern Kufi when it's, it's brought together as a pattern. Now, finally, um, I love circles, clearly. So I, eventually I returned to the circle within, within that work with patterns. I was trying to, okay, how can I bring this back into a, a kind of mandala shape? Um, so we have primordial meme on the left because it, uh, no, sorry, we have primordial waters on the left, which is made up of the, the letter meme, a bit stylized, and primordial breath on the right, made up of the letter ha. Now, I didn't plan to make this a pair, but it's, but it, I, I, and I can't even remember how this happened, but in both of these, there are five rings of 40 letters each. And meme, in the original system is the number 40, whereas ha is the number five. So that kind of links them together. Um, and the, the reason for the title is that the letter meme is doubly primordial. First, it has this egg shape and water associations. Um, the name of the letter actually comes from the ancient Egyptian word for water, which is mem. And it's shared with Hebrew and Phoenician and it's related to Arabic ma. So it has a very deep and old association with water. And the letter ha, it's associated with the breath. Um, in the lunar order of the Arabic alphabet, which is phonetic, ha is the innermost sound. It's a breath generated at the level of the heart. And the other letters travel outward from there. So that was the kind of the idea, but I wanted to do something that looked amazing basically. And, and I, again, by that point, I was only using natural pigments. So these are mineral pigments and there is also gold leaf in there. Um, so finally, um, just to give you, this is 
is it going to load? It's going to play. It's playing. Okay, great. So this is just to give you something to look at while I conclude. <laughs> um, so the deeper I go into my practice, the closer I sail to the tradition inwardly, even though outside I may be going more and more contemporary. And on the outside, it looks less traditional, but on the inside, I'm actually getting more and more traditional. Um, and this is because this is a, to me, this is a living tradition, or at least I, it, I'm trying to make it a living tradition again. And it's important to have the authentic tradition at the core of that, to hold it together. It's like the central spine, without which um, nothing, nothing can hold together, really. You, know, you need the center that holds everything. But at the same time, if you don't work with it creatively, if you don't put your own creative uh, energy into it, uh, then it's a fossil. So the two are absolutely essential for me. Um, uh, but I am not at all interested in ignoring the original principles to have my way with a script. Because, well, first, that would be appropriation. And I, I firmly believe you can... You can um, your attitude can be one of cultural appropriation, even within your own culture. You know, you have, it's not okay. Um, and second, I don't see any point in, in the work if it's not rooted in something authentic and something profound and something that goes all the way back to our, our ancestors. And this, this is not something that happens from a cosmetic layer of, you know, I'm working with Arabic, that's it. That's all I need to connect to my culture. I don't think, I think that's nonsense. It I think it requires a certain degree of surrender to a discipline. Um, because if you really respect an ancient art, you don't take it up on your own terms. You have to give something of yourself to it. And so when I say a greater freedom can be found from such a limitation, that may sound like nonsense, but actually it's because when you are within that, when you are actually experiencing it, What's really happening is that the boundaries of tradition, they create a container for you to work in. So it's a space that is already oriented towards good design. And it's not cluttered with an infinity of poor options. You know, all the bad choices have been eliminated for you. So in that space, I'm not responsible for every single choice. So instead I can focus on the essentials of finding the form that strikes exactly the right notes for me, the way I understand things, because in the end, I'm not a calligrapher. I'm an artist using this visual language to give body to something that is otherwise without form. And that is exactly the purpose for which Kufi was designed. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> is really all I could say. Oh gosh. <laughs> our, our minds are blown, Shumana. Thank you so much for that incredible, incredible presentation. Oh my gosh, thank you. The work is fantastic. And we need to get some of it into Letterform Archive right now. Oh gosh, um, yes, please. <laughs> in the guess. meantime, let's, uh, let's open the floor for questions. People, please, I see five questions in the Q&A. Let's have more. I'm going to read them off to you, uh, Jumana, and then I'm going to try to transcribe them as best I can while you're answering them. Okay, what do we have here? Um, Benam asks, have you looked into the pre-Islamic geometric practices, such as in Manichaeism arts, and how the, they affected the Western styles of Kufi? No, no, because, you know, because my, my, um, I have to, Kufi is already so huge, so, so huge that I really have to really focus on, on my, you know, restricting my field of inquiry. Um, and this has not come up yet. So I have not, you know, Kufi starts a few decades after, after Islam. Um, and that is, and I, and it ends, it kind of coincides with the Abbasid period. More or less, this is a really rough case. So basically, this is my the the you know where my inquiry ends. Now, if something comes up that is important, I will look into it. But I have not I have not got there yet. Okay. All right. Thank you, Benam. Um, Anonymous asks, "What kind of paper do you use for your pieces?" Oh, um, I love watercolor paper. I have um, 
they vary a bit. I, I kind of, I go to the paper shop and I kind of <laughs> feel them. I like really thick paper. You know, I, I love the thicker, the better. Um, and I don't know if you want brands, but brands are a bit meaningless because they, they are very localized. But yeah, watercolor paper, hot pressed, really smooth, but really thick something that will not buckle that that cannot bend basically <laughs> okay yeah i like the idea of going into the paper store and just feeling the paper and and choosing it that way that's really <laughs> great sabiha asks does the decision to use kufic scripts today come with any political meaning given the diversity of identities and changing borders within a modern muslim world regarding sect nationality etc that is a very good question. That is a very good question because I have noticed how right now everybody is trying to claim Kufi. Um, it is, it is, you know, it is being seized on by various nations as a, as a, an identity, and a, it's very political. Of course, you know, everybody claims is kind of subtly or not so subtly trying to claim it as their part of their own national identity. Um, and I have no patience for that at all. I mean, they're playing their own games fine. I, I have nothing to do with that. I'm, you know, I don't know. So, so I think you're right. I think it can very much be that. It don't have to be. For me, not at all. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I serve Kufi. I don't care about anybody else. I don't care about my culture. Nobody is, you know, Kufi and that's it. But uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think it it definitely can be um and that's a pity i think that's really stupid but yeah okay great great answer and um super interesting as well the the, the way that uh you said everybody's trying to claim kufik even if they don't necessarily have a tradition of it uh, absolutely you know i mean some places you're like really <laughs> nice try but <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. We've got uh, Trish Meyer who says, for primordial waters, 40 characters per circle, do you use a computer or template to get the characters evenly spaced? No, I, I do it by hand. Um, I, you know, you draw a circle, you divide it in 40, and then you, you write them. And, and, you know, they're written, they're not painted in, they're written with a pen. That's why I put them under the calligraphic treatment. Uh, no, no, I don't need, I mean, I do use the computer sometimes when, when I'm doing something very complicated and I want to visualize it, but then I go on paper and I construct it completely on paper. So that last one, for instance, that last, uh, the, the video I put at the end where you see me painting it in, it's very complex. And I use the computer just to visualize, to make sure everything was in place. But then I, I spent two days dividing that circle into um, 180 so that I could, you know, draw the kufi in. So I, <laughs> so no, it's, it's, it is by hand, definitely. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and, and it shows in the work, I think. It reflects the handwork that's gone into it uh, very well. Um, Aya asks, hi, Jumana, is there a word, a letter, or a form that keeps escaping you? I would say that drives you nuts, maybe. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I ha you know my sketchbooks. I have a bunch of sketch. You know my sketchbooks. When I when I have words that I haven't really solved, I kind of keep a little bookmark. And my, I I have a lot of those bookmarks along the years. Words that are still there. Um, can I, I? I don't know if I would be able to um, really come up with one now because I'm not necessarily interested in them anymore. But for instance, example: the word Kamal. And I, I mention it because it's my brother's name. So, and someday I would like to work with that word, but so far, <laughs> I don't, you know, it's, it's kind of, it comes with a lot of um, pressure because it means perfection. So you're like, mm, uh, it has to be perfect. Otherwise I better not do it. So yeah, that's one of them. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, yeah, I, I know there's always, especially for, for instance, type designers, there's always uh, one or two letter forms or figures that just uh, pose problems every time. So I, that is a great question. <laughs> um, did I spell Kamar correctly? Is it how Kamal. You, Kamal. Kamal with an L on the end. Okay, okay. K-A-M-A-L. Gotcha. 
Okay, Sam asked, how does your idea of inward outward form and expressing the essence of a letter or word relate to more metaphysical ideas of symbolism and where meaning lies in the world? It doesn't relate to that because I think the way that is being approached in the world is very superficial. It relates to spiritual practices where you just, you don't overthink things, you, but you just do a practice to um, grind down your ego over and over and over until through that, through that grinding down, um, you change, you are, you are transformed. And then you get to an understanding of something. Um, so I would relate it to that. It's not because what you're mentioning is in the mind and that is worthless. That is completely pointless. That is not practice. Practice, you know, the whole point of practice is that it's embodied. You don't think about it. You don't talk about it because these are just abstract concepts that go nowhere that are just really, they stay on this level. But when you practice it, you can become it. Even if you cannot talk about it, it's a lot more interesting. And this is how you know, I mean, there is a there is a oral tradition that Kufi, you know, early is Islamic calligraphy, which is basically Kufi, uh, was practiced by Sufis, and the, the two were not separable. And there, and there is really um, I can see the the similarity between the two practices because they are done the same way. Um, and like I mentioned, in my in my teachers you know, in my teacher's studio, and he is a very spiritual man. We never talked about symbolism. We never kind of went on wild whatever. Um, we just worked and we worked in silence and we sat in silence, but it was profound. It was a diff you know, it was a, a, diff a deeper way of learning. So yeah, so that's, that's how it works for me. I, I love that idea that the goal, the point of practice is that it becomes embodied, that it, yeah. you absorb it and it becomes natural at a certain point. Yeah, I mean, the point of practice is that you are transformed. Mm -hmm. It's not about you doing something to the thing or gaining an understanding, it's about you being transformed, basically. Let's see, we've got a few more, the questions keep coming in, which is awesome. Um, and we have time. So, uh, Baida, Ask what kind of wood do you use for your art? Oh, when I use wood, so um, I don't like to use it too much anymore, but basically um, I mostly use MDF because I, I have it cut into the shapes I need, but of course it needs a lot of preparation because you, you really need to put in a coat of gesso or something that will isolate the MDF because it's very acid. You need to completely isolate it from the paints. Um, yeah, but but you know MDF will not bend in one direction the way other woods would. So there are a lot of technical considerations that if I don't want to get into them, this is the simplest way. But I don't like to work with wood so much anymore because uh, I'm using more natural materials and it's tricky to use them on wood and so on. And it's heavy and I am not getting any younger. <laughs> Honestly, it's just too heavy. So so yeah, but yeah, I mostly MDF. Okay, thank you. By the way, I'd like to remind everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. I mean, you can put them in the chat also, but I can't, I, I'm only looking at the Q&A right now, so I can't answer those if you put them in the chat. So put them in the Q&A. Let's go. Stephen Coles asks, have you seen uh, the um, Goofic Info website? And do you recommend it as an introduction to Square Koofy? Or no. <laughs> Are there any other resources you recommend for novices? So what, no, what um, do recommend it? I look, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to work on a book because there are no resources. There are no resources. The, the, if you want to, um, I always say, just look at historical examples. And, you know, you look at the monuments of Iran, of Samarkand, these, these, this is where you will find proper square Kufi. I don't remember Kufi.info, I did look at it recently um, because, well, it's not, it's not really, it's not 
correct. It's just not correct. And it's based on, and I, I was looking at it recently because I just finished a, a Square Kufic course that I gave on Zoom. <clears throat> it's based on a, a calligrapher's manual, a calligrapher who was based in the West. I don't know when exactly, but not that long ago. But long ago that they, this person who I'm sure was a master in the round scripts, which have nothing to do with Kufi, but I, you know, I hinted in the beginning, round script calligraphers tend to think they know, you know, because they're calligraphers, they understand Kufi. They don't. It's a different tradition. It doesn't work the same way. So these these people started just making stuff up about square Kufi, and I know they make it up because I'm looking at the original monuments, and there's no relationship. You know, these are people who did not have access to Google to look at original examples. They definitely did not travel to Central Asia. They just made it up based on their understanding of the round scripts, which work completely differently. Um, and this, I can see that in the Kufic info site, we, you know, with all the respect to the, the author who is fantastic in other respect and, you know, his, all his other pursuits, he's great. Square Kufi, nothing. Um, so yeah, I do not. <laughs> I am really hoping to be able to put a book out, which is going to be based on a survey of all, all the historical examples I can find. And I've been working on this and I'm, you know, it's a lot of work, but this has not done, been done before. And it's the only way to understand the script. Otherwise, if please do not Google Square Kufic, you will be showered with the most horrific nonsense possible. And it drives me insane. So, Keep an eye on my work. I do give this 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 Zoom course online um, from time to time, and I know tooting my own horn, but you know there's nothing, nobody else was <laughs> doing this, and I think I, we just finished one, and my students sounded really happy. So I, I'm sure I'm going to give it again a few months from now. So um, we can talk about that too, Jumana. It's possible <laughs> you may have an opening at uh, Type West for a workshop, um, but apart from that. Hmm. When's the book coming? Oh my God! Well, uh, well, once I have finished the material, because I am redrawing every inscription that I can find and analyzing it. Yes, there there are a lot, but actually, yeah, um, and figuring out when the, you know there's a lot of that. Once I have that, then I can figure out how long the book is going to be, and then I can figure out how much it's going to cost. Then I can crowdfund it. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, I will be talking about it a lot when I'm ready to, to you know, but right now I'm still just doing the groundwork, which is, which is basically the the donkey work. Okay, so I, I shouldn't hold my breath, but it, I should keep my eyes open for it at some point. All right, we'll be in touch about that because I'm looking forward to learning <laughs> from you more about this. Um, Anonymous asks, when practicing square kufi, we have to decide. For dotted or not dotted, or can it be both? For square kufi? Uh, like I said, the dots are optional. And my own advice is don't put the dots in unless you need them, because they are more trouble than they're worth. But there's, you know, you're free. OK, because they're no more trouble than they're worth. Yeah, the they create are, more The problems. dots are diacritics that, that help indicate vowels. Is that correct? Or is this something? No, no, the dot, they, they differentiate the letters. But in Kufi, this was completely, this was not really relevant. They, they put them when they felt they needed them. If there's an awkward space to fill and there's a dot, great, you can put the dot in. But if you try to put all the dots in, it makes your work so much harder. It gets people tied in knots. And this is why I banished them from my course. <laughs> that if you you know if you can design without dots, then you can you can design well. If you rely on the dots, you're you're gonna be stuck. So so forgive me. I my knowledge of Arabic. I did try to study Arabic, but it, I didn't mm. get very far. Um, uh, is is limited. But these would be the dot that would separate the different kinds of H or N. Maybe is that what we're talking about? Well, it, okay. In Arabic, you have you basically have 18 letter forms, mm -hmm. but you have 28 letters or 29, let's say. So, and it's the presence of dots that differentiate some of them. So you might have the same, for instance, ba, ta, and tha, they're the same shape, they're the same form, but the dots that are added are different. Okay, um, that's that's yeah, that's yeah. right. That's what I was mm -hmm. thinking of. I just uh, 
unfortunately need to um, pick up those uh, old books and dust them off again and bone up on my Arabic, apparently. Okay, um, let's see. Same form, just different dots. But you can still, you can read it from the context is what you're saying. You... Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in the days where Kufi was the, the norm, um, the dots were very optional because it was, it was used for Quranic text. So everybody knew it anyway. So even without the help of those, of those devices, you could read the sentence because, yeah, it made sense. Um, and so they are not considered part of the lesson. Okay. Okay. Guy Menga, hi Guy, says, I can relate to not having a fixed process, but I'm curious about what makes you start a piece. Do you have a goal, inspiration, curiosity? That's a better way of, of asking the question. <laughs> Um, it, it varies a bit, but sometimes I am, um, sometimes a word just kind of resonates with me. One day, you know, I'm reading a text and something really resonates with me and I want to work with it. Or, um, for instance, right now, the series I'm working on, it is a consistent series about loss and destruction versus hope and what remains. So I am looking, I am myself looking for words that that are in that lexical field, if you like, that are all, all you know, every, every possible word relating to destruction in the Arabic language. And some of them speak to me more than others. And some of them call for different treatment than others. So, but I have not done, I have not done this before where, where I am working on a series and I'm looking for words for, to fit all that series. And sometimes, and that's, this is my favorite, but I have no control over it. Um, it just hits me in the head. Like suddenly I'd be like hiking and then like bang. I kind of see it. It's like there. It's like, okay, I need to get to the studio right now because it's, you know, it's there. It's, it has been just, I have been bombed with, with it. <laughs> uh, so I love that. I love it when that happens. That is true inspiration, but uh, I can't control that. But usually it's something that speaks to me in a moment, something that suddenly resonates with me. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. I love that. You get bombed by inspiration. I just get, <laughs> and it's always at the most awkward times. Like, really? I'm sitting on the plane. <laughs> Can't do anything about this right now. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Oh, boy. We got eight more questions. Let's hustle. Mo asks, hi, Jumana. Great presentation. I studied four Kufi styles, the square, also commonly known as Fatimi, Mam Luki Kairani. Uh, okay. Sorry, I may have butchered those. No, 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 Fatimi. You know, I no, I don't, I don't. Okay, it's not. And then uh, Mo asks, where can I learn about the history of Kufi, and do you teach it? You are right. There are a lot of myths around it, and it is very difficult for me to find the truth. Looking for guidance, and then there's more. Yeah. Follow up on my question, I created and designed some pieces in Square Kufi, but how can I know whether they follow original rules or are considered wrong from an authentic point of view? Um, okay, that's a big question. So, right. <laughs> Mamluki Kufi is a complete oxymoron because that is so far after. And Kairawani, you should know, is a modern revive it's a modern um revival based on one quran which is the nurse's quran so it's not a historical script at all uh, and fatimi is to me is the decline of kufi so i'm sorry to tell you but these are these are popular because they were they're the ones that were still propagated by the ottomans uh, and and i'm sorry the ottomans they just grabbed whatever and then they made they made anyway so Sadly, none of these are historical. Um, I, I do have, and we put the link in early on, I have a primer on my website, which gives kind of a quick overview of Kufi and slightly categorizes the style, but just to give an idea, um, there hasn't been an, an exhaustive study. It hasn't been properly studied yet. People are studying it now, but there isn't um, a general a general study for the public yet. Now, if you want a really good book 
it's more for the Mushafi style, but it is a really good histor history of how it came up. It's called The Rise of Islamic Calligraphy by Alain Georges. Um, and th this really goes into the, the first moment. And I think this is the best book that you can, it, it's the only real book really that exists on the, on the beginning of this tradition and on the history and on the deeper history, deeper meaning. Uh, but it doesn't go into the constructed styles, but still the two are very much linked. Um, and there's one that is kind of more, more fancy, more expensive, but it's much, it looks more in more detail at the Mushafi styles, which is um, the Abbasid tradition by Francois Desroches. These are the only two books I have found on the subject that did not make me want to throw them at the wall, okay? Because <laughs> I, I have other books by other people from various places and I, I, they make me want to, I don't know, cry or rage or tear them, you know, because the nationalistic agenda is very much in there. The make stuff up. I always look very simple. You want to learn about it? Look at historical examples. There are hundreds of digitized manuscripts online. Ignore any modern examples. Just look at the, the digitized manuscripts. Um, that's how I learned by examining them, and I spend thousands of hours looking at them. There are those, there are existing uh, inscriptions on monuments, especially the early ones. Look at them, you know, you can, you can bring up hundreds of, I have a catalog of thousands of images. You just look at them. And if you look at them and look at them and copy them and look at them and copy them, you will get there, you will understand. You don't need somebody to tell you these are the rules. You will know because you are, you are you are working from the original stuff so that is the way if you know in the absence of a course uh, because i cannot teach everybody i wish i could but you know i, I also want to make art uh, and also it's embarrassing to just say hey take my course i really <laughs> i hate that i'm only teaching because nobody else is, is, is doing it but just learn from the letters learn from the script it's there you just have to put in the work but you cannot go wrong if you go to the source always go to the source don't don't bother with don't bother with me. Don't bother with what I'm saying. Don't bother with what anybody else is saying. Go to the source. That's all. That's my advice. Okay. Uh, Mo adds an addendum here. Thanks, but I'm already set on joining your course next time. So there we have it. But great, great advice. Go to the source. Um, that's what we do in Western calligraphy, and um, it only makes sense. Let's see, uh, anonymous attendee says dots. I, I don't know, anonymous, I think we, you need to say more. Um, <laughs> another anonymous attendee says, what's the best way to learn Kufi script there being no apprenticeship available? I think that you just answered I that. I just answered that, yeah. Okay, okay, so that has been answered. Um, Mark, says with just the ideas you have currently how many lifetimes will you need to complete your work yeah that's what worries me <laughs> i hope i can get enough done <laughs> before i pop my clogs you know i hope i can leave i can leave documentation behind me so so yeah that's why i can't spend my time teaching because i have to complete my research yeah a few lifetimes i think i think i've already put in a few lifetimes i think uh, <laughs> Right. Do you do you know how to sleep, for instance? Have you tried oh. sleeping? Oh, wow. <laughs> sleeping is for tortoises. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Okay. If sleeping is for tortoises, I gotta write that down. <laughs> okay. Um Mark says, you mentioned, ooh, you mentioned gathering pigments, and it looks like you have made pens. Hmm. How important is all that in your art? Okay, yeah, actually making, so I didn't talk about materials here because it's a, it's a letter form um, oriented talk, but the materials are, making materials is very, very important to me because for me, the, the creative process does not feel complete if I, if I start halfway. And by halfway, I mean buying ready-made materials, especially if they're synthetic. So, and you know, I'm not judging anybody who does. This is really personal to me is that I really need to start from, from scratch, from the raw material, uh, I need to put in the work to transform it for my purposes. And it's very, it's very bespoke. It's really every, I, I prepare them exactly as I need them for a given piece. Um, and to do that from nature because, you know, I'm plastic free and I, I really 
need to bring this um, it's, a, it's a way of bringing these two together because again Kufi is a, it's a spiritual practice in the end but I want to include the earth in that otherwise it's, it's a bit of nonsense really but when I, when I start from gathering pigments or you know processing plants bringing taking out the ink um, and then preparing that so that I can start a piece then I have a complete process um, and, it, and it is a complete alchemical process. And that is important because you transform, you go from something completely raw and unformed. You bring into it the, the power of consciousness and you end up with a completely finished art piece, which is, which is something completely else. And this process for me is the whole point of art. And, you know, when I finish a piece, I'm, I'm done. You know, I can't tear it up. I mean, I need to sell it to make a living. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not interested anymore because... The process is the point. Um, and the rest, the, the, the finished piece is just the, the, the leftover trace of that process, which for me is much more important. So yeah, it, it, materials are extremely important. And in other, in other talks, I have talked about them extensively. Um, there is, um, if, you, if you look on YouTube, there's a talk called The Art of Letting Go that I gave in Stanford last month, where I talk exactly about materials. Uh, and you you will get a much more in-depth answer. Wow, that that's uh, that's amazing. I mean, I noticed that every piece you showed, you showed a bit of your process, and so I I realized that it was very important. But this is it, it, quite incredible. This is like the journey is the destination, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. And and I I like that. I mean, I appreciate that for you. Once the piece is done, you know. <laughs> the, the the whole the point was the process because it's a spiritual process hmm. um okay let's see what do we got here we have uh we have 10 more minutes roughly that we can use up so anonymous asks are there contemporary explorations and applications of Kufic works such as yours being used in a religious context, in mosques or in religious scripts? Oh, um, I definitely know about contemporary um, works in Kufi, but I don't, I don't, I don't specifically know about uh, their use. In, I mean, there must be because I know that when I was working with Sayer, we we worked on quite a few pieces that were commissioned for for those contexts. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know, just because I don't think these are necessarily publicized so much. So sometimes I see, um, um, yeah, there's one case that comes to mind. I'm not going to say which, because they, they didn't know what they were doing. So it's all wrong inside, which is really a big shame. But, but I mean, you know, it, it is, yes. But I couldn't name you specifics because I don't. I, I would need to to be following architectural projects because usually when they build contemporary mosques, they always do contemporary calligraphy inside them. But because I'm, I don't really follow actively that kind of work, I I can't give you any ex examples. I'm sure it is though. Okay. Now I'm curious the one you were talking about, but I guess we'll just let that go. Okay. Um, Patrin Roos asks, Martin Ling's Splendors of the Quran is great, but so very expensive right now. Patron, is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> I know I don't even have a copy because it's just impossible to get one. But yeah, it's beautiful. But beautiful. Okay, we'll try to answer that non-question as best we can. Okay. Um, Lynn Simmons asks, how did you come to this practice? Have you always been interested in calligraphy? Good question. No, I mean, the, the story I told you is exactly how I came to it. Um, I was not particularly interested. I never thought, I never thought of it. But when my teacher asked me to come work with him, uh, it's just because I knew he was such a respected man that I, it, and it was such an honor because he never, he never took anybody in the studio. I'm the only one uh, that I said yes. Um, and that was it. And, you know, the, the, the discovery that it was my vocation came later. Um, but no, <laughs> my, my Arabic handwriting is still absolutely awful. You know? 
Well, yeah, I think most calligraphers in in the West might say that as well um, about their own yeah. hand. Being a good calligrapher doesn't necessarily mean that you have good handwriting. In some cases, it's as bad as the doctors. Um, so your but your teacher, you you had this person as a teacher. How did you hook up with them? Did I I may have missed that myself? Right. Well, I was I was I studied graphic design. Um, and he was giving, and we have obviously a typography course, and the typography course was Latin and Arabic. And he was, you know, helping with the Arabic part. Okay. Uh, because at that time, there were no Arabic typographers. I mean, all of, all of, pretty much all of those I know who come from Lebanon, they kind of <laughs> were in that class with him, basically. Um, and he noticed that I was really good with my hands and really careful and patient which most people in the graphic design setting were absolutely not. They just did not, they did not enjoy that. And so he, um, he asked me to help him with a couple of freelance projects over the next couple of years. And then finally, uh, he basically, <laughs> at one point he, he just, after, after the 2006 war, he just lost the will to make art. So actually that's why he asked me to come because he, he, he said your presence well, my presence would help him work because he just, uh, yeah, couldn't even, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, we were all very depressed, but uh, yeah, that's how it started. Um, remind me his name. Can I put that in the, Samir Sayer. For that. what is that? Samir Sayer. I can, I can, I, should I put it in the chat? Uh, yeah, because I am afraid my uh, transliteration skills are very poor. Thank you. Um, Samir Sayed. Okay. Samir Sayed. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Eleanor asks, have you seen the book Ink and Gold? I have it over there. <laughs> uh, you like it? Oh, oh it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Great. Now I got another book to add to my shopping list. Um, Anonymous says, what's the best way to learn Kufi script? Okay, I, we did that one. Okay, Katrin says, do you think um, Mar Martin Ling's Splendors of the Quran is a good source for watching? Well, it has a lot of really interesting examples. So yeah, I mean, this is the kind of, of book that I would have just so that I can study the text, definitely. But it's very hard to find. I mean, we mentioned it earlier. It's almost impossible to, to get a copy now. But uh, you can find these, you know, the manuscripts that are in there, you can find them online. You can find images of them online. Okay. Uh, Baida asks, what happened to your mentor, Mr. Sayed? He is still working. He is still doing calligraphy. He is still writing about it. And I still call him and uh, <laughs> tell him how I'm doing. He's, whenever I go home, he's the first person I visit. Okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, McNog asks, why is it that so many of the best lettering artists in the world claim to have bad handwriting? Is it because they don't care enough to about, about it to slow down, pay attention, and practice their handwriting? I sense judgment here, McNog. <laughs> For the same reason that when I cook, I am a messy cook because my work is so accurate and so careful that when I'm home, I just want to let everything go, right? So when, I, when I'm writing by hand, don't bother me with good <laughs> principles of calligraphy. Just leave me alone. You know, I, need, I need to relax somewhere. <laughs> I love it. Okay. All right. Let's see. We got a couple questions left. Uh, Hi, Tham asks, what do you think of the state of Arabic typeface design? Is there hope based on uh, Kufic scripts? Um, you know, I'm really not an expert because I keep an eye on typeface design as a as a just as a pleasurable hobby, but I'm not I'm not next, you know, I'm not a typeface designer, and that is a Typeface design is a completely different field. Um, even if you just, even if I just point out the fact that I don't want my work to be legible, which is quite important for typeface, right? Um, but I think, you know, there are a lot of really good designers right now, and there are a lot of really terrible designers. 
And the problem with, from what I've seen, and this is not an in-depth study, but you know, when I go to the Gulf and I look around and I see the Thai faces, what, from what I see, um, they based, that, based them on the, a lot of the ones that are supposedly based on Kufi. They're not based on Kufi. They're just based on the rectilinear grid, just because it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. It's not a headache. You don't have to create all these connections between letters. An idiot can do it. And by the look of some of these logos, a lot of idiots are doing it. You know, and they're, they're really not serving the, script, the, the type faces at all. And they don't know anything about Kufi. Obviously, very obviously, except this, you know, really superficial idea of it. But there are also a lot of really amazing designers that I follow. So I think there is hope. But the problem with the Arab world is that they still have a long way to go to start to appreciate good design. They, for some reason, it's not part of the culture. And, you know, I can say this because I'm from over there. They don't care. They will go for the cheaper thing and they cannot see it and they don't know anything about the Arabic script to begin with. They think they do, they don't. So, <laughs> so yeah, good work is happening. Ironically, it's happening um, under the pen of designers who live in the West where good design is appreciated. Well, hopefully we can, we can help change that, right? Yeah, I mean, so it will happen eventually, I think, someday if the region doesn't completely descend into chaos <laughs> okay let's see one last thing if we shouldn't use kufic to search online for images what do we use asked anonymous no what i what i said is don't google square kufic because you will get a lot of bullshit but sorry <laughs> um, look look for historical examples look for um you know, for instance, go on Wikipedia, bring up a list of the uh, historical mosques in Iran or monuments in, in uh, Uzbekistan, and then look up these monuments specifically, and you will you will see the inscriptions on them. This this is what you need to do. Don't look for the work that people have done. Look for the monuments. And Square Kufi is all on monuments. Uh, you know, there's no point in looking for it on paper. And for manuscripts, there are so many collect. You know, you. I mean, you have to do the work of research, but so many uh, libraries and museums around the world, they have digitized pages that you can look at and they, they're, give, you know, they're, they're in high res, et cetera. So look for historical examples. And that's not, you know, once you get the knack of it, it's not so hard, but don't just, don't just Google Kufi scripts because, you know, that's the door to hell. <laughs> I've got to put that, the door to hell. And that, We'll end our lecture um, today. Googling Kupik scripts is the door to hell. Um, 